In this video, we are going to take a look at the direct antibody test, otherwise known as the DAT. In blood bank testing, when we talk about uh, anti antiglobulin testing, uh, we refer to the direct antibody test, or the DAT, and the indirect antibody test, or the IAT. Um, the difference, I mean, the similarity between them is they're both looking for red blood cells that have been sensitized or coated with IgG antibodies and or complement. Now, the difference is that the IAT takes place in vitro, meaning in a test tube. Um, so examples of when we would use the IAT would be in the weak D test, in the antibody screen, the antibody identification panel, and the cross match. Um, the direct antibody test, or the DAT, we're looking for red cells that have been sensitized um, in vivo, meaning in the patient's body. And examples of when we would use the DAT is to investigate a uh, possible transfusion reaction where a patient has received more than likely a unit of red cells and those red cells contain an antigen that the patient lacks. Another situation would be hemolytic of the disease, hemolytic of the dis hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, excuse me, otherwise known as HDFN. And that situation is where, uh, again, it's an antigen uh, mismatch where mom lacks an antigen and the baby contains that antigen and therefore uh, mom's body elicits an immune response against the uh, baby's red blood cells. So uh, I just want to talk briefly about a term that I have used a few times already and I think it's a term that can be kind of confusing for students of blood bank um, and that is the term sensitization or sensitized. Um, all the, uh, the, two, the two situations are uh, the sensitization of red cells and the sensitization of a patient. So the sensitization of a patient is when a patient lacks an antigen and is exposed to that antigen and therefore the patient's body recognizes the antigen as foreign and its immune, the person's immune system remembers that. So the next time they see that antigen, they may, uh, I mean, they may elicit an immune response in that instant when it sees it, for, when the body sees the foreign antigen for the first time. But usually the danger lies in future exposures to that antigen. So for example, if we have a, a female who is pregnant uh, for the first time, and she is D negative, and she has a D positive uh, baby. Um, so what happens is the red cells, the D positive red cells in the baby get into the mom's system. And if those red cells are not counteracted with Rogam, mom is going to become sensitized to the D antigen on the baby's cells. So in that particular pregnancy, it's probably not going to be a big problem. It's really future pregnancies that are, is where the danger lies. So if mom is, uh, if, uh, if she's pregnant again, and she has a D positive uh, baby, and in the first pregnancy, she didn't receive Rogam, then her body is going to recognize that D antigen and be able to uh, elicit an immune response very quickly and effectively against the baby. And that's how we, that's how we have HDFN. Um, now, talking about the sensitization of red cells, all that means is red cells have become uh, coated with IgG antibodies and or complement. And remember that uh, this can happen in the IAT, meaning in vitro, in the test tube, or in the, you know, the DAT is, is detecting when we have in vivo, meaning in the patient's body when the red cells become coated with IgG antibody and or complement. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to testing. So this is a very quick test. Um, it can be a very quick test. Uh, we're only going to use initially one test tube. So... Um, what I have done is I've received an EDTA tube, I spun it down, I took the plasma and put that in a tube, and then I made a 3%, 3% red blood cell suspension, and I washed it three times. And the reason it's very important to wash, properly wash your red cells, is because we are going to be using anti-human globulin reagent. And if we don't wash those cells and there's excess protein or complement or antibodies in there, they can bind up the antihemoglobulin reagent and the test may not work properly and therefore we will not have accurate results. 
So I'm going to just use one test tube. I'm going to put the last four numbers of the patient's identification or medical record number on the tube, in this case, 2396. And I'm going to write DAT. I'm going to add one drop of the patient's uh, th washed 3% red cell suspension and two drops of polyspecific antihemoglobulin. Okay, we'll just give that a little shake and we'll spin it for 15 seconds. Now in the next part of the video, I will talk about the antihemoglobulin reagents, the difference between polyspecific and monospecific. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read this on my special uh, blood bank mirror. Okay, so for me, that looked like a, a one plus. Now, I'm not going to, in this situation, when we have a, a uh, positive polyspecific DAT, we have to go ahead and run the monospecific. And I'm not going to go through all that testing because basically it's the same procedure, but we will talk about it in the next segment of this video. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, result sheet or our record sheet. So our patient, uh, you know, we have today's to date, we have our patient Jane Doe, we have no history on the patient, this is the patient's medical record number. Um, for the ABO testing in the front, we had 0, 0, and in the back we had 4 plus, 4 plus, which means that it's an O patient. Um, and the, the D testing uh, came up 3, uh, three plus, and our, our, our control was negative. So therefore, we went ahead and put our interpretation over here that this is an O positive patient. Now, looking at our results for the, the uh, direct Coombs, and direct Coombs, by the way, is a, kind of a, an older name for the direct antibody test. We can see here we have places to put polyspecific and then our two monospecific reagents. So we ran our polyspecific antihemoglobulin reagent with our red cells, and it came up one plus at three at uh, at uh, initial spin. So we go ahead and record that. Now the reason we have a five uh, an apostrophe here is because if the test does not come up positive at initial spin, we need to let it sit at room temperature for five minutes. So. Um, we tend to think of complement and IgM antibodies as being uh, room temperature or cold reacting. Therefore, if we give them a little bit of extra time, they might turn up positive. So when the polyspecific and the direct Coombs comes up positive, we have to do the monospecific. So the polyspecific reagent has both anti-IgG and anti-complement in it. Now the, uh, the monospecific have one or the other. So when I did these test results, I had to do two tubes, one anti-IgG and one anti-complement. So you can see here that both of these have initial spin phases that we need to read. And then if this one is negative, we have to do the Coombs check cells to make sure that it was, the, uh, it was run properly and everything was working fine. Now you can see over here with anti-C3, we have that five minutes again. And that kind of supports what I said before that with complement and IgM antibodies, we tend to think of them as being room temperature or cold reacting. So um, when I ran the monospecific anti-IgG, it came up as 2 plus. So I don't need to do the check cells because the test was positive. Now the anti-C3, 
at initial spin and five minutes, it was negative for both. And uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm using zeros for negatives on my results sheet. So in the end, our results are that we had a positive polyspecific DAT, and then we had a positive monospecific anti-IgG um, uh, re test result.